So, on to the main event. And you may recognize our speaker today from his history's headlines on WFMZ. Frank Whalen is a local historian, educator, and author of several books on Lehigh Valley history. He also served as the on-air historian for PBS 39's documentary, Hess's Hollywood on Hamilton Street. So, here to talk to us today, Frank Whalen. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Thank you, everybody, for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, first, I think I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I was uh, born in Orange, New Jersey uh, in 1949, October 22nd. Uh, I uh, grew up in Livingston, New Jersey, and um, I had a, uh, I had a family. I uh, grew up with, uh, I'm the oldest of eight, <laughs> and uh, my uh, parents, uh, my father worked for Sears Roebuck selling washing machines and dryers, but uh, his family, his family was actually quite wealthy at one time. They owned, uh, created Whalen's Drug Stores, uh, and uh, back in the 1920s, they were doing really well, but not, <laughs> not uh, so well since, since then. But anyway, we used to hear the stories from them about the, the good days when they, as my grandfather used to say, when we had the money. So, <laughs> So uh, I had um, got interested in history fairly young. My father had an interest in it. Uh, when I was sick with the measles, nobody gets that anymore, but uh, back in the uh, like, uh, 1950s, I was, uh, having, I was fairly sick. And my father, instead of reading me uh, fairy tales, read articles out of the American Heritage History magazine to me. So I got an interest in history from them. Uh, at, at that age, and uh, then I was in school. I went to St. Philomena's Catholic School for grade school, and I went to um, the Livingston High School in Livingston, New Jersey, uh, and both of those were very good schools. I was very fortunate, and I studied history, and you know, at, when you study history, you have a lot of people saying, well, what are you going to do with that for years? And that's true. It's not exactly like nuclear physics, where you can <laughs> do something with that. But I uh, got uh, a variety of positions. Uh, first, when I went to uh, high school, I had very good uh, things in high school, very good history teachers in high school. And uh, then in uh, college, I went to a small college. My family didn't have a lot of money, so they couldn't send me to a lot of places. So I had to uh, go where I could. and. Uh, a couple of good friends of mine, two uh, African Americans who were uh, at this uh, place called Essex County Community College, where I started, uh, they said to me, we can get you, uh, we, we think you should go someplace that is uh, not Essex County Community College. <laughs> and uh, so uh, they managed to help me find funding to go to a small college in Illinois called Blackburn College. And there I really matured and grew as both a historian and a person over those years. I uh, then went, uh, uh, and one of my friends from Blackburn at the time was uh, studying journalism at the University of Missouri. I don't know whether you know this about the University of Missouri as one of the oldest journalism schools in the country, and it's an excellent school. And uh, he got me in touch with some professors there at, the, uh, at Missouri and uh, they were able to find a fellowship for me. So I was able to, to do that there for a while. And then I got a number of other things that I did, but basically worked work for. And finally, I got a position with the Missouri State Archives. I was assistant state archive, archivist for the state of Missouri uh, back in the late 70s. And uh, from there, uh, somebody else told me about uh, the morning call and uh, that they were creating an investigative team, and they wanted a researcher. Researching was one of my specialties in the variety of things that I did with history. So uh, I said, sure. <laughs> came to Allentown. And uh, that's uh, when I came here. It's kind of a strange situation. Uh, I don't know. Many of you people, I'm sure, are familiar with Donald Miller, who was the person who ran the morning call for years, and his son, Ed Miller. Uh, and they... Uh, but uh, they didn't always see eye to eye on things. But uh, so what happened one day was that uh, 
Ed Miller said, I'm tired of having my father interfere with everything I'm trying to do, so therefore, I'm, I'm leaving. Well, Ed Miller was one of the reasons why I came to Allentown, and I was supposed to set up this historical, uh, this team of reporters and do research. Well, now that Ed Miller was gone, I was not going to get a chance to do that. So I was like, what, what do I do? What do I do? I left the job in Missouri, and I came here thinking everything's going to be great, and now it's not going to work. So that was that. And the new editor, Larry Hyman's, uh, came in and said to me, uh, we were talking one day, and he said to me, well, uh, can you write? And I said, well, yeah, I did a little writing for the college newspaper and University of Missouri paper, and I can do some things, and I can do history for you. And he said, well, my advice to you is to start doing so. So I thought, okay, I better start writing. So I did a couple of articles. I did one on the PPNL building, its history, and uh, I was... Uh, very interested in that for a while, and I, and I worked with a very talented individual there, a man named Ken Rainier, who was a, uh, an artist, is an artist, and he uh, did the illustrations for my stories. So they attracted a lot of attention, and uh, one day Larry Hyman takes me into his office and says, I don't know what you do exactly, but, well, you know, uh, people seem to like it, so you can keep on doing it. <laughs> well, okay, so I can keep on doing it, so I'm going so so to be employed, all right? So, uh, and I, so then I worked for the Morning Call for a long number of years, uh, for about uh, almost 30 years. And uh, then a lot of things happened with the paper. The paper got sold to the Chicago Tribune, and they didn't like the way things were done at the Morning Call. And so, and they were in trouble too. I don't know whether any of you have been by where the Morning Call was lately. It is now a large pile of concrete ground up, and supposedly they were going to build apartments there. But uh, that's the nature of the newspaper business these days. When you kind of business with the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times are having trouble, the Morning Call is going to be having trouble. So uh, finally, uh, I was sort of back and forth with, with them. And uh, then, of course, the big thing happened, which I'm sure you, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, I was, uh, I got into an argument with the editors, and it was basically what happened was a lot of senior people were let go at the call. And this was done as a plan by the Tribune to get rid of people who were, you know, that, that might cost them money if they retired. So anybody in the 50-ish or older category was suspect. And they tried to find ways to get rid of us. Well, some people did, some people didn't. Well, basically, what happened was uh, they uh, didn't like the fact that uh, Bob and I were named by the gay pride organization here in Allentown as a couple, and they said, well, at that point, gay marriage was a big topic, and they said, oh, you're doing, you're doing something that has to do with gay marriage, therefore it's a subject that uh, is in the news, and you can't do that because you can't take part in this parade it is after I had been at the morning call for years, and everybody knew I was gay. It wasn't, wasn't, a, wasn't a surprise. And uh, so, but this was a, a wedge they used to try and get rid of me. And to make a long story shorter, uh, it was uh, finally, uh, we ended up, uh, we, I was in the parade. They fired me, basically, a, a, as a result of that. And uh, then we got Rick Orlowski as our lawyer, and he managed to go through the process of getting after them, and uh, they, they had forced to admit that yes, they were doing this to us specifically to get rid of us for older people, and this was discrimination, and Rick Orlowski got them to back down, but uh, it, was, it, was, it was a struggle, uh, but uh, Bob and I went through it. Bob had already left the call, he had, was working with a nonprofit agency, uh, a housing agency at that time, uh, and so he had, so he was able to keep us going while I was looking for work. And I was telling uh, Trish earlier that uh, I had uh, this uh, whole, uh, whole business with the, the morning call repeated itself with Channel 69. Channel 69 contacted. I, I heard from a friend of mine who worked, had, had worked for 69. He said, you know, they, they are always hiring people. Why don't you go up and try and talk to them about hiring you there? And I said, okay, fine, I'll, 
I'll go and do that. So I went up there and I talked to this gentleman, Brad, who runs the, he doesn't run the station. He, that's uh, Dick Dean and these people who are up there who actually own the station. But he uh, interviewed me, sort of, and he said, well, we have, you know, things like um, school board meetings. We can give you 25 bucks for one of those. You get to get in the meeting, you know, kind of thing. And I said to him, Brad, you don't understand. The morning call called history, it's brand, I know history. You know, and they've made, you know, they've, they've done really well. So with that, and so he said, okay, we'll try it. And so they, I did a couple of articles. And then they saw, ah, they had a following. I have people who read the more articles from the call. So they knew what I was involved with. And so they, Brad said to me, uh, it's so similar to what Larry Hymans had said to me years before. Well, we really don't know what you're doing, but people seem to like it, but you can keep it up. And uh, to be uh, candid about it, I bring in an awful lot of advertising. If you try to get through reading history's headlines, and there's ads every time you turn around. So you know, uh, it's, that's, that's the way it worked. But when it comes to history in the Valley, um, I, as I said, I graduated from the University of Missouri. I worked at the Missouri, first I went to the University of Missouri's archives, and then I worked at the uh, Pennsylvania, rather, at Missouri State archives. And so I not knew a lot of Missouri history, but uh, nothing much about Pennsylvania. And so I met, I came here and began to educate myself. I read up on it and uh, found out about the Lehigh Valley and its history, and it's a very interesting and unique history. I was uh, mentioning to Chris earlier that I had actually uh, uh, was instructed when I got here by some very good, knowledgeable local historians, not necessarily academics, but people who were very involved in knowing the local history. There was a couple, uh, Anne and Craig Bartholomew. And Craig worked for Bethlehem Steel for a long time in the purchasing department. But he had a fantastic knowledge of the whole processing of steel and the history of steel. And, his, and he, he just was really, really into it. And I just was wowed by his knowledge. Also, a gentleman named Lance Metz, who was uh, with the Canal Museum in Easton. And he knew all about not just canals, but all about the local industrial history. And so it gave me a range of knowledge of things that I was able to tap into for articles for the morning call. And uh, so they, I ended up there on the features desk do working that aspect of it. And then, of course, with uh, Channel 69. Uh, 69 has been uh, very receptive to uh, what, what I do. As I told Trish, they do pay me something. Not much, but they do pay me something. And so I do uh, I enjoy, enjoy that. And uh, I'm, uh, uh, I, I will look, look back on the history of Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton. One of the things the Morning Call did do, which was good, was when they hired a new person, they came in, they said, now, before we hire you, you have to have your history lesson. And Frank Whalen will give you the history of the area. Because a lot of people they hired were not from around here. And so what I did was I used to tell them, there are three things you have to understand. Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton. They're different towns. There's different histories. There's different kinds of things happened that created these very unique communities. And people, uh, a lot of times, will say, uh, well, there's Philadelphia. It's got a great history. Why aren't you doing Philadelphia? I said, well, I mentioned to Trish. I said to them, you know, it's, it's a funny thing that uh, Philadelphia has so much history. And there's so many people doing Philadelphia history that anything I could do would be lost in the sauce, so to speak. I could, but here, there, there are some people, it's, a, it's something that people are interested in. I have to tell you that uh, the Lehigh Valley people are very much interested in history than other parts in the country. Um, people in Missouri were sort of kind of interested in St. Louis and Kansas City, but you couldn't really get them to there were no really significant things. People were not interested in history. So I talked to them uh, about history things in Missouri. I said, yeah, sure. Uh, because a lot of people there were not from the area. Here in the Lehigh Valley, you have families that go back centuries. Uh, the Pennsylvania Germans, obviously, are very, very uh, careful about their history. I met a lot of interesting people in that area. Dave Velisca, who was with the historical, Pennsylvania German Historical Society, 
uh, and other people. And so that led me into doing the history of the Lehigh Valley. And that's one of the reasons why I've been successful. It's folks like you folks who are interested in the history who actually have a chance to talk, talk to me about it. And uh, I, over the years, I've interviewed an awful lot of people from people who were models for Hess's uh, was room there, the French room, uh, to this one lady, she was a waitress at uh, the old Brass Rail, which is unfortunately deceased. And uh, she, uh, she would tell me about it, and she was, she was a, a model uh, at Hess's in, in back in the 70s and, and 80s, and she gave me a lot of good information, and all kinds of people. So history is about lives of people in, a, in long and extensive ways, and I try to bring that out. I try to talk about individuals in history, and because I've been told, as I, people told me at the morning call, Frank, you have to understand, people like to read about people. I thought, okay, first lesson. Eat a bill. So I started to write about people. And it was, it was fascinating to me that uh, I was able to actually uh, make contacts with a lot of different people. Plus, there are a lot of very good people at the call that I knew. Uh, Albert Hoffman, maybe you remember, he was the music and theater critic for the call for a while, uh, quite a while. And uh, Jane Cuck, who was uh, the travel writer and was involved with, the, was related to the Cucks and the Lays. Uh, and uh, Speaking of which, I, Sally Lay lives out there at the Glades with us and near us. And she's very, very nice. And one day I asked her, do you have any history of your family, Sally? She said, wait a minute. <laughs> Give me a day or two and I'll, I'll come. Up. So I came over to her apartment there at the Lakes. And there she had on the table these huge volumes of history written by her dad, Jack Lay. A long family history with photographs and just fantastic stuff. The kind of stuff we historians die for. So it was, it was just an incredible, incredible, fascinating history. And uh, I wrote the story about it, and she was very pleased with that. Because she said, you know, at, uh, we sort of got, they, people didn't, you know, everybody talked about Hesses, nobody talks about Lays. I said, okay. Another person that was very good for me to know was uh, Kurt Zwickel, uh, very unfortunately early death because of uh, Blue Gehrig's disease. But uh, Kurt was a wonderful, wonderful person. And uh, he had all kinds of connections with the state, with history. And so he was able to give me, tie me in with some of those, those people. And um, we were doing the his, Hess's history book. And of course, Kurt's dad was a photographer for Hess's for many, many years. So Kurt had access all these photographs. And one day he came to me and said, I've got the photographs, you can know how to write, let's get together and we'll go make a, a, an Arcadia book. Uh, and so we did. And uh, it was funny meeting the various people at Hess's, uh, from Hess's, Wolfgang Otto, who was the window dresser for their many years and was the director of design. And he had, uh, he told me a story we're working on. Uh, he had come to, uh, Hesses from Germany in 1957, and uh, he had been hired to, to do window displays. And he did a lot of that in, in, uh, there in uh, Germany. And uh, he, so he was doing, he came there, he was working after he'd been hired for about, oh, two, three weeks, and uh, with, with another employee. And they were getting a front street, well, Hamilton Street window ready, and they were you know, working on some various uh, mannequins, and a man comes in with, as uh, they said to me, was a uh, uh, his auto described uh, Wolfgang Otto described to me as with in a ratty raincoat with glasses askew, and looks up, over at him and says, "Otto, that's not the way you do it. You do it like this." And goes and puts the thing over, and and he uh, and Otto. Wolfgang Otto, if you met him, you understand he's real. He was a really meticulous individual. He did, and he was prickly, <laughs> to say the use to use a word. And uh, and so this guy comes. So this man then takes off, and uh, he said, uh, he said to his assistant, "Who is that man? Who is that man? Who is, who is that man?" And he says, "Well, he said that's Mr. Hess." 
So Mr. Hess, it was his candy store, as they say. And they ran, he ran at that like, like that. Um, and I've heard all sorts of fascinating stories about him. Uh, been out to his house, was out to his house uh, a couple of years ago when it was owned by other people. Of course, Mr. Hess died in the 60s, so I never got to meet him. But um, it was interesting to uh, hear all these different, very different stories from different people when Kurt and I were working on the book. And uh, I should tell you that uh, the book was extremely popular around here. We uh, tried to get Arcadia involved. We kind of went to Arcadia and we said to them, you know, you, you don't understand. This is going to be a, a real blockbuster book. You're going to have to. This is Hess's is not just a department store. Hess is an institution in the Lehigh Valley in Allentown. This is going to be, you got, and they said, no, 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 we know how to do this. We've done department store histories all over the country. There can't be any different from any place else. Well, um, so we had the first day in the building that's now the, uh, the Butts building downtown uh, there on, on 9th and Hamilton. And uh, we were, uh, had the book set up, Kurt and I, and waiting for people to show up. And boy, did they ever. One guy came in and ordered 17 books. He's sending them to relatives in Montana and Hawaii. Uh, and he has people all over the world. And so he got, got all these books. And so in about uh, half hour, we were sold out. <laughs> there were people standing in line to get in to see this, getting this book. And then we had a, a reception at a, at a restaurant, a local restaurant, uh, just outside of Allentown, um, and uh, that, uh, and, and we, it was a Christmas time. You know, Hess is Christmas, Hess is Christmas, it's a symbiotic thing, and they, and so we had a whole pile of books there, and then the books, we said, we'll be here, we'll advertise being there till nine o'clock with the books. By seven o'clock, we were sold out, and uh, <laughs> they uh, just, uh, I couldn't believe, finally, this woman came in and said, where are those books? I know they're here. What are you hiding them? Why are you hiding them from me? What are you doing? <laughs> she said, I have relatives. I want those books. I said, ma'am, I'm sorry. It's Christmas. You know, it's Hess. So you might want to know that, and I don't know all the details of this, but I think there were a couple of people from rumors we heard at uh, Arcadia that were seeking future employment elsewhere as a result of <laughs> not, not listening to us, Kurt and I. So um, that's sort of the impact of, of history here. Uh, it, it, it is very, very significant to people here. And I, that's why I uh, am, was able to make a, a living at it and a good living. And I can't, uh, so, but also it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And uh, I well, actually wrote a, a Gen General Trexler's biography a while back when, he, uh, when it was an anniversary of his uh, birth. And I was approached by the Trexler Trust to do something, not trivially elaborate, but just as something of its history. And uh, I uh, found out a lot of interesting things. Um, one of them was a fellow who was a, uh, an attorney in Allentown who told me he was the last member of the Trexler board who uh, actually knew General Trexler. And uh, he said uh, that uh, the day after General Trexler died, um, uh, Nolan Benner, his aide-de-camp, showed up at the office and started to uh, dump file folders out of the window like crazy. So I thought, okay, that's, that's interesting. I didn't put that in. But uh, the, uh, it's, it's interesting to, to get that kind of insight into him. And also, uh, I, I enjoyed uh, talking to the people at the Trexler Trust, and uh, they're very, very, very helpful, very, very helpful. So it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting thing, different aspects. And, and interestingly to me was one of the things was that General Trexler was actually uh, kind of like, a, uh, would look at prototypes of people in, in the national scene and emulate what they were doing. And I've noticed, I've done some writing on J.P. Morgan, the financier of the late 19th, early 20th century. And it was fascinating to me that uh, a lot of things that Morgan was doing, uh, basically in a small scale way, Trexler was doing in Allentown. 
So he was keeping up with what was happening nationally at the same time and seeing using those things that Morgan was doing, at looking at it and adapting it to Trexler, uh, Trex, rather to Allentown. And that was uh, interesting. That was very interesting because it puts the larger, it's the larger scene. Allentown, uh, especially at that time period, was a town where people did look at the larger metropolis to see what was going on and tried to uh, at least emulate things that could apply to Allentown. And, uh, and it's also probably very helpful that the uh, uh, Lehigh Valley Railroad had the Black Diamond to take the executives going in and out and, and so to, to New York, and a lot of them did. Of course, uh, General Trexler had his chauffeur, Charlie DeLong, take him in to those meetings. And, uh, but that's, and that's, of course, where Trexler died, was that on that road to Easton, uh, on the highway there, and um, every time I go past it, I say to Bob, I said, that's, oh, there's where General Trexler died. Bob says, I know that. <laughs> You've told me that. <laughs> okay, okay, so. So, uh, so that's some of the things that I've, I've uh, ascertained from being here with, uh, being in Lehigh Valley and finding out about the area, the steel industry, the, the, the development of industry in America uh, has an awful lot to do with Lehigh Valley uh, not just the steel industry, but the early days of the canals and the railroads. They basically had a lot of, a lot of start, a lot of ways, from the, uh, this area. And so I could talk more about that, but uh, I wanted to open it to questions. Anybody have questions? Yes, Ron. Good morning. Is it working there? There we go. Now it is. First of all, thank you, Frank, for coming to talk to us. And uh, thank you so much for your book on General Trexler. That was one of the more interesting things I've seen at the Historical Society down at 420 Walnut Street. It's a book that Frank wrote with about a dozen separate articles on different aspects of General Trexler's life that you don't hear of anywhere else. And, and it wasn't all glowing praise either. It was more what included all that and, and a little bit more. Um, Back around 1980, there was a TV show called Lou Grant. Oh, yeah. And one of the reporters was Joe Rossi, or Rossi, I forget how it was pronounced. And he made sure that he was not a member of any organization or could be accused by his newspaper of being political in any way. Right. And somebody decided to be mean to him and sent in memberships to lots of organizations so that all of a sudden he's a member of lots of different <laughs> things. Of course, that didn't happen to you, but what did happen to you was the statement that you were being political just by being the parade marshal. Right. Uh, am I, am I, it's not the way you just described it, but is, is that accurate? Uh, that the, there was a I statement was, that you were uh, political. Bob, Bob and I, yeah, uh, that was sort of the political thing. At the time in Pennsylvania, as it was across the country, gay marriage was an issue. Uh, and Bob and I, of course, weren't married here. They are actually, tell you, we were married in New York uh, and uh, because we figured if we waited around for Pennsylvania, it would take a long while. So <laughs> we did do that. And, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, I, I, I'll explain it to you what, 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 what happened. Uh, the Los Angeles Times had owned us for a number of years. They sold us to the Chicago Tribune. Chicago Tribune uh, it was not terrifically interested in quality journalism, to put it bluntly. They were interested in making a lot of money, and of course, the Morning Call did that and gave me quality journalism at the same time, but the Chicago Tribune uh, was not the same way. So one of the executives, I'm going to say her name, Ardeth Hilliard, uh, and uh, she um, decided that she was sort of forced by the people of, of in, in Chicago, get rid of them, you know, get, get into, I, I actually sat through a session where they gave us what seemed to me like the third degree sign shining a light in our faces at the whole time and saying, are you going to leave or not? And I refused to leave for a long while. I, I put up with them for a long time. But uh, I just, I, I said, my, my feeling was very strongly that this is my constitutional right. If I'm not a citizen, if, if we're in Russia, you know, and I have to listen to you, and I can, I'm not allowed to take part in a, what is not just a political right, but part of my identity, you know? I tried to explain this to her. I tried to explain to her, 
and, and she would not listen because as, uh, who was it, uh, Upton Sinclair, I think, said it's uh, kind of a, a uh, it's difficult to, ma to get a man to see something if his paycheck depends on him not seeing it. And, and so uh, I think that's what was going on here. But at any rate, she uh, tried very hard to get me to not be in the parade with Bob. She actually got on the phone to, and I'm not going to be, she, I, was, I was getting a massage. And somehow she got the known phone number of the person who was giving me the massage. And I'm lying on the massage table, and she gets on the phone, and she's yelling, are you going to be the parade or not? Are you going to be the parade or not? Yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. And I'm like, what? What is this? I've worked for you for 33 years, and this is the way you're going to treat me? Like this? What is the problem here with you? I mean, everybody knows that I'm gay. I mean, everybody at the call but back in the 1980s knew I was gay. I, I didn't, didn't, well, I was just normal. I, you know, Bob and I used to have a saying that we called normal gay per persons. You know, <laughs> it's not, we don't fit the stereotypical image that immediately, and that people had that thing. Not that I have anything against that. I look at people, all the types of people, and, uh, and, and as I say, uh, a good person who worked for uh, Ray Holland and I were talking, and he said to me, he didn't understand all the gay hairdressers and people like that, and he said, why aren't you like that? You're gay, why aren't you like that? And I said, well, John, I have to tell you, I don't judge people. I don't, un I, these people have gone through, these hairdresser people, gosh knows what they went through just growing up. I said, and so as a gay person myself, I can understand what they, and so if they're acting ways that you find weird, it's, there's probably based on a life that having to go through persecution and being picked on, being called a sissy and everything else for their whole life. So I really don't, I, I don't ju judge people. And I said, I am what I am and they are what they are. But, so I guess I'm wandering from the subject, but in any event, they, uh, she, she fired me. And um, I uh, decided, well, that's, I, I, was, I was so furious, I was on the phone with her, I was just livid, livid, I was just, yeah, I was, Bob got on the phone and really yelled at her. And, 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 yes. She fired you the day after the parade, right? Right, the day after. Okay. And, and one of the things they did was the day after the parade that, that swung the case in my favor was that instead of really covering the parade, what they did was they covered Frank Whalen and Bob Whitman being in the parade. And uh, our lawyer was able to prove that they liable to me. And one of the first things that they teach you in journalism school is don't libel. And we used to get lectures from Mal Gross, that was the attorney at the time for the call, and he would, they would say, uh, don't, li don't, don't libel. And they, the lawyer, Orlowski was able to prove that they had libeled me. And by what the way they handled this. But the thing was, he, so, so they did. That's, that's what happened, Ron. That's what happened. It was, a, it was a very sad day. I didn't want to leave the call. I had been happy there. I wanted to stay there. I didn't want to, and I, I just was really just frustrated and angry and bitter. And I did work for the Historical Society for a while, and uh, that was, that was good, good times. But, uh, but fortun unfortunately, because of uh, certain aspects of the economy in uh, 2008, uh, they let me go. So that's when I had to go to uh, Channel uh, 69. Uh, but I, uh, I tried to do whatever I could to uh, be, be involved. I was involved, we were involved with local day organizations, that's true. We were, and, uh, but all those years, well, I was involved very deeply with some of those with Lehigh Ho and with the other organizations, no one at the morning call ever said to me, you're doing something wrong. Nobody. Then Artis Hilliard arrived and suddenly, I'm doing something terribly wrong. So, so in any event, that's, that's, that's what that went on there. Any other questions? Hi, Frank. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna take a moment of personal privilege here. I'm reading a book by Ben McIntyre. It's the story of Godievsky. Gadievsky, the Russian KGB agent that was the number one uh, 
agent in England, and he, he read out their KGB and became an agent for the, uh, for the uh, English. And because you're an author and they're big in history, I don't understand how he, the McIntyre or you, can put together all this information. In other words, you've, you've met with all these people. Is all, all this history in your brain, or do you have files galore of all this material <laughs> to keep it organized? Because I could never keep we it. Have you have no. files. <laughs> We have, there are ways of making you talk. <laughs> uh, I mean, is that no, we, you just organize the heck out of it? I, I, God gifted me with a very, uh, or somebody gifted me with a very, <laughs> very... <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> and, but the, 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 the thing is, I have a, a, a good uh, knowledge I was taught history early, and I have a very retentive brain with, with history. Then um, I asked my fourth grade nuns about my retentive math, math history, which didn't exist. But when it came to uh, history, I uh, was very, very interested in it, and I just like soaked it up like a sponge. My grandfather would tell me stories about, and one of the great, great stories was in 1910, they went to Italy uh, with his, his parents. They had a private audience with the Pope, and uh, Pope Pius X, the Catholic Church now considers him a, quote, a saint. Unquote. And uh, I said to my grandfather, what did he say? He says, how the heck did I know he spoke Italian? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, but uh, I, I just am just fascinated by the past. And so when I see something and I do, do I re retain things. And the other day, Bob and I were having lunch with the archivist at uh, Muhlenberg, Susan Bolsiano uh, Moladano, and uh, she uh, was very, uh, she's very knowledgeable and very helpful in some articles that I've done, and she's throwing things at me, you know, saying, oh yeah, well that was that, and this and this and that, and so this is what I do, you know, it's been my life, and so, and so that's when people say to me, why aren't you studying nuclear physics or investment banking instead of going, this is what, this is what I do. And I always enjoyed doing it. And the thing was that, you know, a lot of people said to me, well, you know, you have to take a job. You don't have to enjoy it. You just, you know, you just, just take a job, which I did many times. I've, I've, had, I've had jobs that have not been, like, and car, well, I, I, with the, I, I've worked in pipe fitting plants. I've done in, uh, I've done works what I need to do when I need to do it, but that's not history. But um, I have always... Uh, tried to do, just, always, always been interested in history. And a good friend of mine from college, Walt Harrington, he was the one who got me the jobs at the call and, and brought, mentioned me to editors and things. And he had an interesting career as a reporter. So he ended up at the Washington Post and interviewed uh, uh, George H.W. Bush when he was president. And uh, he was, uh, so he, he had a fantastic job, journalism. But... Uh, he helped me find connections, but he was always fascinated by my knowledge of history. So yeah, history, how, how do I do it? I don't have, I, I, can, I can keep in knowledge of where things are located. For me, it's more finding, knowing where a thing is located rather than just going ahead and uh, getting uh, knowledge from uh, a variety of, of sources, having at my fingertips sources. Uh, I know how to do research. I did research before there was the internet. So, uh, <laughs> but the internet is, is helpful. I can't deny that. It's very helpful, especially now with what I do for the, the newspaper. I mean, I happen to write not, not the newspaper from 69 because I turn these things out, you know, one a week. And that takes a lot of concentration and a lot of information. And uh, I don't know whether you saw it. I did an article uh, back about Franklin Gowan who was at the, uh, the mine, he was a mining, uh, mining executive who had got himself tangled up with the Molly Maguires in the coal regions, and he was not a, not a, I should say, not a nice man uh, in a lot of ways, uh, and depending on your, your point of view. But he, I thought, I got this idea for a story, and I thought, you know, Franklin Gowan, Franklin Gowan, I knew that he had been, he committed suicide at one point later on, in his career, and so I thought, there's gotta be an interesting story here. Something's gotta be behind this. 
And if the man who was head of the Reading Railroad for a time is, uh, committed suicide, there's got to be information out there. So I started looking around, and fortunately, I found uh, an excerpt from the, uh, the Washington Evening Star newspaper from 18, from his death. And it gave a really very interesting article, very interesting information about it. And so I used that to describe what had happened, what, how, he, how, how the newspaper used, described it and used it, and I'm in my own words, what had happened. So that's the kind of thing I, can, I, I like to do uh, with history. Because I know people are interested in it, so I'm like that. Anyone else? OK, then give it to Barb after you're done. Um, I guess two things. One is, I'm sorry that you had to go through what you had to go through at the, mer at the morning call. Right. I'm, I'm, I, I work in employee relations, and I find that kind of conduct by an employer to be outrageous. Um, but the second thing is, and I'm going to feign a ignorance, um, I'm relatively new to the Lehigh Valley, so I would be curious, and I, I am a history buff, but I don't really know anything about the history here. So um, someone who doesn't know about it, what might be one of the two most interesting or important factoids of, um, regarding the history of the valley? Okay, uh, probably one would be the development of uh, the, uh, the iron industry in America that revolutionized the Lehigh the industrialism in America came out of uh, people in, came the first successful anthracite coal powered iron furnace in the country came from, was in Catasauqua. And uh, the uh, people, there was a man named Josiah White and his partner er Erskine Hazard and they went over to England and brought a man named uh, David Thomas here, and he created, because a lot of people in America had been experimenting with anthracite coal and didn't know, how, as an industrial fuel, and didn't know how to do it. And this man did, and this was the real beginning of the industrial revolution in America uh, as, an, as an industry. That, 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 I think, is probably one of the most crucial uh, episodes in American history that has the valley at its roots. And um, let's see, let's see. Mm. Mm. And well, another one, and it's not existent anymore, uh, was the streetcar lines. The streetcar lines in the Lehigh Valley were among the first that spread themselves out uh, in the 18, uh, 90s, 1900s, and that's where General Trexler made his first big money. But uh, what they did was at first led to the development of suburban America. Because before there was the automobile, there was the streetcar. And the streetcar, so the idea of, of the modern suburbs is rooted in the uh, uh, streetcar movement. And there's a, an excellent book called Streetcar Suburb uh, by a, uh, an author uh, of uh, an academic up in uh, New England, and he used the streetcars around Boston as a symbol of how that changed. And also to Los Angeles, if you look at Los Angeles, talk about highways in Los Angeles and whole interstate highway system. Before that, those routes were all pioneered by the streetcar system. Los Angeles had a great streetcar system until, of course, the automobile took it over. But the fact is, those are two instances I can see, the, but the streetcar system in the Lehigh Valley was among the first in the country to develop the way it did. And then, so, so those are two, two instances that come to mind for me at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, who's, uh, Good morning. Um, I have two very different questions. Sure. Um, my first question is, as a result of the lawsuit that you that you had against the morning call. Uh, was anybody rehired? Was, was there any remuneration or damages? Well, uh, well I, they, they, the morning call gave me uh, what I got was uh, two years pay and two years worth of medical benefits. But nobody, because nobody, clearly it was pretty widespread. I just wondered if it. Well, we had a, 
the, 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 the situation that developed was that one of the people who uh, recognized what had happened was a woman uh, who was a, uh, had came, come out, came out from Chicago to be the publisher. And um, I'm trying to remember her name at this point. I used to know it that well, but I don't, cannot, coming of it flashes through my head. She had gone to the, uh, uh, the attorneys and said that uh, the, you, you, had, uh, you did this deliberately. She, she knew she was in to touch with what Tribune was doing to us. And so she did that to, uh, I guess, to Orlowski and uh, the attorneys for the morning call who were uh, jumping on my case at a meeting in Mal Gross's office at one point. And uh, Su Susan Hunt, that was her name, Susan Hunt. And she, uh, she had said this. And, and then uh, Orlowski comes in at the last minute and he said, oh, we have information here from Susan Hunt which says, that yes, they were doing this deliberately, and yes, they wanted to fire you because you're old, and yes, that's the reason why they did this, and then, and then uh, so so that that was I I never, I mean uh, I was so sort of happy to to get what I got from them because that was the agreement the attorneys made, but uh, there were several people, um, and I, Artis Hilliard was one, another individual who I won't name because he's local, but his he was very involved. And he was the managing editor, and the two of them were the ones who were behind us. And then, when it looked like they might go to jail for doing this, that and then, whoa, okay, okay, now let's see. So, um, so yeah, so that's where that's how that 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 ended up. Uh, but um, I, uh, I, I just was happy to get what I got. Um, other people got some. Some people got less, some people got more, a little more, so depending on the seniority. Um, but uh, I, and I was pretty close to the seniority because I was there for 33 years. So, and, but uh, they basically boiled down to, uh, they libeled me and also that they did this deliberately for age discrimination, pure and simple. Well, I'm I'm glad you stayed and fought, actually, <laughs> or or at least fought. We did um, we did try and fight. Uh, you find out in the legal things, and uh, Bob and I are talking. We had another legal situation, which I won't get into here because it's not relevant. But uh, it uh, was uh, we discovered that certain factions within the world have certain friends in higher places that will have let may have set the laws up to favor them, you know, and so. Um, my second question is, um, uh, Dave and I moved here in 2005. We were both professional musicians for 35 years before that. And um, both retired when okay. we got here, figuring there, there wasn't anything for us here. Anyway, what I discovered since then was this really interesting culture of concert bands. Oh yeah, and Allentown itself has four. Um, yes, <laughs> and uh, you know, plus there's McCungy, There are two in Bethlehem. There, I don't know how many in Easton, um, but Allentown in particular has four, yes. which I think is is very interesting. And I'm not sure that this is something that exists anywhere else in this country. And I'm wondering if any if any research has been done. If there's anything written about the history of these, of these odd bands? Well, over the years, I've tried to do one or two, two articles about the rap bands. You know, of course, the Allentown band is the, the one that everybody turns to. And, it, it exists. and they travel all over the world, so they get attention. But uh, the others, uh, I think it's mostly that they were, they grew up out of, sometimes out of municipal institutions. Uh, a lot of the like the firemen would have a band, and the municipal uh, workers would have a band. And if you look back in the history, history, the roots of these bands, those those bands, not the Allentown band, but the right. Allentown band goes back to what, right 1820s or something like that. Um, as as the, as as a, and that's how they trace their history. At any rate, Ron Demke had me up there in their office and showed me what they had, and they have 
everything since the dawn of time. So with, with that. Uh, they're definitely the oldest, but, um, uh, well, for instance, I, I play with the Marine Band, and they're 19, I believe they're 1903, and from what I understand, they, I mean, other places in the country, that's true. Yeah, they were, um, you know, part of a fire station or, or some such thing, but um, I, I believe these bands were, are independent of that. So I, I'd just be curious. I, I would love to read a bit. Okay, <laughs> some, okay. Some kind okay. of history about okay. this because okay. It, okay. it baffles me because I, you know, we lived in New York for 35 years, and sure, there were lots of bands there. Right. But it's a huge place, you know, right. the five boroughs. And, um, but, you know, this, this small area to... to to house that, well, and, have little you know, rod. unfortunately, it's yeah. kind of dying now. So I'm, I'm afraid they're going by the wayside. A lot of I, rivalries developed. You see, this is this is town had had that, and the various organizations yeah. would compete with each other, and the police band would compete with the the other band, and and the marine band would compete right. with other bands. So that was part of the the culture, at least as far as I can see, uh, going back. I, you know, you make a good point. It's a story idea. I like that. <laughs> Please do. Grist for my mill, <laughs> so to speak. Anybody else? Anyone? Have you ever done anything uh, on the uh, Bach wire, which is oh, yes. very old? Oh, yes. I did something. I did a number of things on the Bach wire over the years for the call and for 69. I did a piece on the the Wallies, Fred Wally, uh, and uh, that, and so, uh, so, as a matter of fact, I was working on a story, and there was a, uh, this was a number of years ago now, and uh, there was a lady who was, uh, had, had been, act her family had been active with the Bach Choir for a long number of years. Uh, she wasn't, but they had been. And uh, I mispronounced Fred uh, Wally's name, and I, and I, I like to think, the, I, I, I sort of envision it. She sort of metaphorically wrapped her uh, lorgnette on my fingers and said, it's Wally, Mr. <laughs> so, uh, I, 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 I like, she, uh, she, she, was, she was an interesting lady. She was an interesting lady. But uh, I, I did write something, uh, and unfortunately it never got uh, done. Uh, Bethlehem had asked me to write a history, uh, continuing, a continuous history of a variety of, 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 from in the 19, of the 1920s up to modern times. And so I started to write it. Unfortunately, the people who were interested in me writing it, each one of them, each one of the groups decided they wanted their group should be predominant than the other group, and so therefore. It didn't work out, but uh, they did do a long thing on the, the, the band, the Allentown, and rather the, rather the uh, back choir with uh, involving uh, Charlie Schwab and his uh, contribution to reviving it, uh, and uh, and I did uh, it did some of that, and I did a nice piece on their concert a concert they had in New York in 1920, uh, and uh, I wish I'd hung on to that stuff, but uh, but that's an idea, so I'll keep that in mind too. See if I can do something with that. Well, I have a question. Um, not specifically to Lehigh Valley or anything, but is there an era of history that you find more fascinating for yourself than another? Well, there's two or three, actually, but I, I do find uh, the industrial history of America interesting. I didn't for a time, but then I met Lance Metz and the people, Martholomews and those people, and so I began to study the... Uh, and if you ever get a chance to go to the... Uh, the Canal Museum in Easton, they have some really great uh, exhibits on uh, industrial history. So I, I have an interest in that, and I know this is a little bit esoteric, but I'm interested in Greek and Roman history, and I read uh, essentially on that. It was a real thrill to me in, in 2012 when I actually had a chance to go to Italy and go to Pompeii, and, that's, and we, uh, Bob and I were in a little bit better shape then. I, I'd done a lot of walking to prepare for it. And so we uh, went into uh, uh, this group that was actually, they, they, you take a bus halfway up, 
and the rest of it, you can climb Mount Vesuvius. So we went, climbed up Mount Vesuvius and got to look inside of Mount Vesuvius. My grandfather had always told me they, they did that. They went up to Mount Vesuvius, but I'm thinking to myself, these Edwardian people in those fancy clothes, got, they're walking up to Mount Vesuvius, I, I, I'm not, it's not happening. And so we got there at the top of the, the Mount Vesuvius, and there was a young woman, very nice, the Italian equivalent of a, of a tour guide, and uh, just a national and lady. And we, well, I asked her, I said, now my grandfather says he got here, here and that in, 19, in 1910, and how could they do that in those days? She said, oh, well, of course, there was the funicula. I said, the funicula? She said, yes, the, the, uh, the car, the, the, the uh, what do we call them? The, the cars that uh, take people up on ski slopes and things. Only the cable car. Thank you, sir. The cable car, and uh, the cable car. And uh, he said yes. And here's this spot. And she showed me this big cement location there. And uh, she said, "This is where it used to stop." And I said, "Well, why did they stop it?" Well, during World War II, uh, a load of American bombers were coming back from a raid in North Africa. And they would have had to, uh, had, they, had lo they were loaded with bombs, and they didn't know what else to do with them. So they dumped them inside Mount Vesuvius, which started an eruption of some sort, but not, 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 not Pompeii. But she said, this, this is what happened. I said, oh, okay, now it explains Mount Vesuvius. And he hadn't lied to me, and this wasn't a story. It was true, and he did it, so this happened. But... Uh, so Greek and Roman history has always been sort of, a, and my grandfather got me interested in it, uh, gave me a copy of Caesar's Gallic War when I was 10 or 11 or something like that. And, and, I've sort of, and I've always been speaking, I always get aggravated when people say, oh, you're too young for this. You know, they used to say to me, oh, we, you can't possibly understand that. I'd say, word use, you know, uh, like, uh, no, I, I, don't, don't tell me what I can't read and I can't do and I can't understand, I'm gonna do it. And sometimes, maybe I got to the point where I was a little frustrated, but other times I said, well, I'm beginning to get understand it. And uh, so, so that's, that was, that's always been, been my approach. But I, 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 and I really got a thrill sitting in a, an amphitheater in Pompeii uh, in a seat that could have been sat in by some ancient Roman centuries before. I mean, it just it shivers up and down my spine to think about it. So that's, that's, that's history weirdness for you. <laughs> last call? Any last questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, Frank. We, oh, you're welcome. It was a great welcome. talk. Thank you.